This episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Do you want a new podcast to look forward to each week? One that's got it all, entertainment, information, and stuffed with actionable content? Yeah, you do. Because who wouldn't want to listen in as Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people from athletes, authors, and scientists to mobsters and spies? Each week, Jordan uses his interviewing talents to bring you never-before-heard stories and insights to make life more understandable. He has one of the most highly rated self-development shows out there. Listen in, learn, and look forward to each new episode, like I do. And I would like to recommend a few episodes myself. The first one is episode 650, Brian Kloss, The Corruptible Influence of Power. And the other one is episode 585 with Timothy Snyder, 20th Century Lessons on Tyranny. Check them both out. You can't go wrong with adding the Jordan Harbinger show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting. There's never a dull show. Search for the Jordan Harbinger show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Audible. As you should know by now, Audible.com can make you happy for hours at a time, and your first experience of happiness can be for free. Go to worldwar2podcast.net and click on the Audible link. If you decide that happiness is for you, sign up for the 14-day free trial and get your free audiobook. You can keep the membership if you want, but if not, you certainly get to keep the audiobook and the happiness it brought you. For this episode, I would like to recommend The Storm of War, A New History of the Second World War by Andrew Roberts. The Second World War lasted for 2,174 days, cost $1.5 trillion, and claimed the lives of more than 50 million people. But what were the factors that affected the war's outcome? Why did the Axis lose? And could they, with a different strategy, have won? Andrew Roberts' acclaimed new history has been hailed as the finest single-volume account of this epic conflict. From the Western Front to North Africa, from the Baltic to the Far East, he tells the story of the war, the grand strategy and the individual experience, the cruelty and the heroism, as never before. Meticulously researched and masterfully written, The Storm of War gives a dramatic account of this momentous event and shows in remarkable detail why the war took the course it did. Hello, and thank you for listening to A History of World War II Podcast, Episode 31, The Beginning of the End of the Third Republic. France was on the precipice. Her best troops and armor were gone. Her air force was shattered. The two leading generals, Vega and Pétain, much loved and respected by the populace, increased their control over the shaky government, and they no longer wanted to fight Germany. But Premier Renault did, and Churchill wanted to help him in any way he could. Hitler had to be stopped. As for Hitler, he got on with his war against France. He wasn't much worried about Britain and Churchill's defiant speeches. They would see the light soon enough. On June 5th, the day after Dunkirk surrendered, the German forces that had been building up along the River Somme and southeast of it started to move. It was time to drive on Paris and end this with yet another amazing success, led by their Blitzkrieg tactics. The British could only offer one infantry division and part of an armor division. Considering the results of the previous British intervention, even this small gesture should have been respected by the French, but it was not. Also, the RAF could provide few planes. Air Marshal Downing had already given more help to the French than he felt best for Britain. Enough had to be saved for the home defense, or it would all end up being meaningless. As for the British, the question was, how much do you help someone who is going to lose anyway? General Spears, representing Churchill, met with the French cabinet, and there was not going to be a meeting of the minds. The British could not give the French what they wanted or needed, and Vega would not let go of the fact that the British had made for the coast instead of fighting with them to the last man. Of course, Vega had conveniently forgotten that this move allowed over a 100,000 French troops to be saved as well. After Spears left, the French cabinet then argued amongst themselves. 
Reno asked Venga, If the battle was really over in front of Paris, why shouldn't the government leave the capital and set up a new defense again in Brittany further west? Vega rejected this idea out of hand. Then Vice Premier Pétain spoke up, which he rarely did during these meetings. He said if the battle was truly lost, the courageous thing to do would be to treat with the enemy. But Renault came back with the firm belief that any terms of an armistice with Nazi Germany would be unacceptable, so the army must fight on. The cabinet would have the same conversation every day, without change or progress, for over a week. Despite the French command having no heart in the fight, many French generals and units fought tenaciously and held back some of the German troops and armor. The defenders were outmatched and outmanned, but fought for hearth and home. But in the end, it came down to numbers and air superiority. On June 5th, 90% of France was still unoccupied, but now that worked against the French. The Germans had room to maneuver with their superiority in numbers, but... Flush with victory, the German high command decided it wasn't necessary to go around the French defenses. They would go through them. Of course, France could have traded space for time, like China did against Japan. But Paris could not be moved, and many did not want to see the city obliterated. Besides, the Germans came so fast, it was soon taken away from them as an option. Vega, as commander-in-chief, had few options for defense, so chose the most straightforward one. His men would make a stand at the front along the Somme and Aisne rivers. No retreating was allowed. They would stop the Germans there, or not stop them at all. This order was issued on May 26, which was easy at the time. The Germans were not pushing on the line, yet. A few days later, on May 29th, Vega told Renault, If the line breaks, the struggle is over. But for some reason, Vega still wanted the government to stay in Paris. Some speculated the general wanted the government to be captured. The politicians would then be gone, and the two militaries could work something out. This would leave the French military to run whatever unoccupied France was left over. At the very least, Vega was too focused on political events. The situation on June 5th was such that Renault finally did something he'd been dying to do since the start of hostilities. He shook up his cabinet. He had been stymied many times before when he tried, but now he had nothing to lose. There would be no asking permission or considering the political ramifications. The changes would be made. He let three ministers go, of which one was Secretary of War and former Premier de Ladier. Unfortunately for Renault, they were replaced by three men who soon came under the general's spell and also wanted France out of the war. So the long-awaited move proved pointless. Renault then offered the foreign ministry to Pétain, but he gently refused. There was not enough time to ask why. So Renault probably eagerly took the position for himself. One other change was making Charles de Gaulle, a newly made brigadier general, the undersecretary of ministry of national defense. Was he qualified is not the question, but he was always of the opinion of fighting, no matter what, and Renault needed that. Churchill had been equally impressed when they met. The French certainly had enough time to set up their defenses below the River Somme. To prove this, almost every available man was in position by June 5th. So picturing France in a mental map, the River Somme runs in an east by southeasterly direction with many twists and turns, about 50 miles northeast of Paris. On the coast or furthest on the French left was the 10th Army. To their right, was the 7th Army that would heroically resist four panzer divisions so strenuously between Amiens and Peronne that the Germans would have to move their attack further down the Somme, or more east. To the right of the 7th was the 6th Army, and to their right was the 4th, and then, closest to the Maginot Line, furthest on the French right, was the 3rd Army. During the morning of June 5th, the Germans pushed along the entire 400-long mile line, and their control of the air proved significant. Most French troops fought well, but were unable to hold out for any duration. During June 5th and 6th, the 15th Panzer Corps, with Rommel's 7th Armored Division in the lead, pushed in 10 miles past the Somme between Abbeville and Amiens. By the morning of June 7th, the front of the French 7th Army held out, 
but their flanks near the coast and deeper into France did not. And by the end of June 7th, the situation had become critical. After his initial success of 10 miles, General Rommel's 7th Armored Division was able to push 30 miles further after he broke through the French lines. All this was at the expense of the French 10th Army, closest to the coast. The 10th was now cut in two. Trapped with them, and with their backs to the sea, was the 51st British Division. The Panzers ended up near the Seine River, which is roughly parallel with Paris. This gives you an idea of how far the armor had pushed. As June 7th went by, many of the French troops felt hopeless. They threw down their arms, removed whatever parts of their uniforms they could, and joined the mass of people running south and west, in whatever conveyance they had, to carry the old, young, and sick. The soldiers noticed that many of the people's clothes, at least their fronts, were muddy. This was due to the numerous times they had to throw themselves to the ground when a German fighter would come in low and strafe them. As the refugees reached Paris, their fear spread to the citizens of the City of Light. The French troops, desperate and helpless, started looting. It started out with the idea of not leaving anything behind for the invaders, but quickly became more. Their world was ending, so anything and everything was up for grabs. Many things that could not be carried away or used up were burned. At the morning meeting on June 7th, all they got contributed was the same argument of the British running north for the coast instead of fighting to the south. But on this morning, with the situation what it was, he yelled every word. But, also like before, it was due more to the Germans' action than any British fear of fighting. After General Spears left this meeting, the cabinet argued again, using the same words and arguments they had before. The defeatists said the war was lost. There was no point of a redoubt in Brittany or in North Africa. Then Patton would finish the conversation with his belief that it was time to treat with the enemy. Badeau, the Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs, now switched his loyalty and any future vote to the generals. The next morning of June 8th, the cabinet met again, but this time the new Undersecretary of Defense would be nearby to support Renault. De Gaulle decided to meet with Venga before the meeting. Soon after talking together, de Gaulle could tell the commander-in-chief had given up. De Gaulle tried to go the general into a fighting mentality, but instead, the extent of Vega's defeatism was shown. To start, Vega informed de Gaulle that the Germans were already over the Somme. De Gaulle, all right, they're over the Somme. And after? Vega, after? It's the Seine and the Marne. De Gaulle, yes. And after? Vega, after? It's finished. De Gaulle, what do you mean finished? What about the world, the empire? Vega laughed. The empire? Don't be childish. As for the world, as soon as I'm beaten here, England won't wait eight days to negotiate with the Reich. In Paris, June 8th was a repeat of June 7th, June 6th, and June 5th. June 9th found the Germans only 40 miles down the Seine from Paris. East of Paris, the N had been crossed. Pétain made a formal demand in writing for an armistice. He conceded that the terms would be harsh. In the end, he would have no idea how harsh, but if acceptable, then the government should proceed and end the bloodshed. Renault replied, no honorable deal with Hitler was possible, and what about the French alliance with the British? But Pétain did not think much of that last point. That evening of June 9th, the full cabinet met with President Le Bras. Vega gave a full and thoroughly depressing report. The president then asked Patin for his opinion, but Patin had said all he intended to that morning with his formal note. The meeting ended with the cabinet deciding it was time for them to quit Paris and head to Tours on the Loire, about a hundred miles to the southwest. On June 10th, the government fled Paris, and de Gaulle attended his first cabinet meeting, but Patin was noticeably absent. He simply did not want to be where de Gaulle was. Vega reported the bad, but always getting worse news. The Germans had crossed the Seine in two separate places. The French armies to the west and north of Paris were in full retreat. He finished by saying it was possible the Germans could be in Paris within 24 hours. Renault asked again for a redoubt, or temporary defensive line, in Brittany, but Vega all but refused. De Gaulle supported the Premier's request, but it did no good. Actually, de Gaulle knew the redoubt would not work. 
but it would at least set up the eventual government evacuation to London or North Africa. This was always de Gaulle's angle, but then the news got even worse. At 4 p.m., the French ambassador in Rome called the premier and informed him that, at midnight, Italy would join in the war on Germany's side. Later that night, at Charlottesville, Virginia, President Roosevelt said, On this 10th day of June, 1940, the hand that held the dagger has plunged it into the back of its neighbor. France panicked, but neatened of. The five or six remaining French divisions positioned where the 32 Italian divisions would attack would be more than enough to hold them back. So the French government and cabinet joined the 8 million people on the roads that left Paris and headed south. Before June 8th, Vegas said Paris would be defended. There were about 10,000 troops with 200 anti-tank guns and blockhouses set up. In support were 30 tanks and miles of anti-tank obstacles with ditches. As the magnificent 7th Army fell back on Paris, the numbers of the defenders only grew. But in reality, there would never be enough men to stop the Germans. The French could bloody them, delay them, make them pay for taking France's honor, but stop them? No. And as June 9th came to a close, there was no change in plan to defend Paris. In fact, a newly made Army of Paris was put under General Pierre Ehring, the military governor of Paris, on June 10th. These forces were put between the 10th Army, west of the capital, along the Seine, and the 7th Army, east of the city, along the Marne. General Ehring followed this up on June 11th by stating that the capital would be defended to the last. But it was not meant to be. Because of poor communication, Ehring did not hear Commander-in-Chief Vega's statement when Renault asked him on June 10th about the city. In writing, Vega declared, Paris is an open city. In order that Paris shall preserve its character as an open city, it is my intention to avoid any defensive organization around the city on the belt of the old fortifications or on that of the ancient forts. Renault and Churchill finally had their answer, and they were sorry for it. Getting a bit ahead of ourselves, Ehring did not hear the answer until June 13th, but by then the Germans were closing in on the eastern and western sides. General Ehring withdrew his forces to the south of the city. By the afternoon, advanced German forces made it to the city to find the vast oil depots burning, but the factories were left alone. Soon the Renault works and others would be turning out guns and tanks for the Germans. Now that the status of Paris was uncomfortably set, the French generals considered their options on June 11th. It didn't take long. There weren't that many to consider. It was decided that there would be a general retreat. The Maginot Line would be abandoned. A new line was to be drawn, and all able troops were to make for it, hopefully in an organized fashion. Starting at Caen, just over 100 miles to the west, at the bottom of the Cherbourg Peninsula, the line would go south until the Loire was reached. It would then turn east and go until it ran into Switzerland. Of course, just below Switzerland was where France and Italy touched. This plan meant that most of France would be abandoned by the government and army, but it was the only way they saw of staying in the fight. But then, Vega had the order of general retreat halted. He told General Georges not to issue it until he heard directly from himself. Later on the 11th, Churchill made his way to see Renault and the cabinet. The latest news given to the British Prime Minister was even worse than he imagined, and so he could not believe it. So General Georges, who Churchill knew and trusted, was brought in, and he verified the deteriorating situation. It simply came down to, now that France had committed all her troops she had left, the Germans had broke through their lines, and that meant the struggle was over. But here... Renault chose to reassert himself into the conversation. While looking at Vega, he told Churchill that although the commander-in-chief, Vega, had accurately spelled out the situation, the government, i.e. he, would decide their future action. The two French adversaries stared at each other, until Churchill broke the silence by saying, Do what you have to, but Britain will never stop fighting. Then the French members present in their entirety turned on Churchill, and demanded all of his fighter planes. But Churchill would not budge from keeping the 25 fighter squadrons at home for defense. Churchill countered with the idea of the Brittany Redoubt, or fighting from North Africa. Vega shot them both down, again. Later that night on June 11th, 
Renault found Churchill alone and told him that Marshal Pétain said it was necessary for France to seek an armistice, and he had written a paper on the subject, but had not yet given it to him. Renault assumed Pétain was too ashamed to hand it over. Hey everyone, Ray here. I've never told you this before, but I live in a cove. It's very nice, but everyone around me is retired, and they spend hours every day on their lawn, which always leaves my yard bringing up the rear. But now I have a ringer, that being Sunday Lawn Care. This year will be different. Yes, spring is here, and it's time to get the lawn ready and keep it looking great. Again, I'll be leaning on Sunday to help me, and if you should give them a try, like me, you'll not have to worry about chemicals. Your lawn will look great, and your family will be safe. Because Sunday can help you grow a beautiful lawn without the guesswork or the nasty chemicals. Here's how it works. When I signed up for Sunday, their lawn analysis tools created a personal nutrient plan delivered right to my door when I need it. They send the packages, I attach them to my garden hose, and spray. I'm done in less than 15 minutes. No more hard work. Instead, I'm working smarter. And you can too. And Sunday is offering our listeners 20% off. Full season plans start at just $129, and you get 20% off at checkout when you visit GetSunday.com slash World War II. That's 20% off your custom plan at GetSunday.com slash World War II. During the next morning of the 12th, there was a short meeting of the Allied leaders. The French re-emphasized their desire for British planes and troops. Churchill vowed he would talk sympathetically with his cabinet. But then he re-emphasized his request that no decision be made without consulting him. He then pointedly asked Admiral Danlaw, head of the French Navy, to make sure the French fleet would never be handed over to the Germans. Darlan replied, There's no question of that. It would be contrary to our naval traditions and to our honor. So Churchill headed home, but knew in his heart that it was only a matter of time before Britain would be standing alone. His concern now was Hitler getting his hands on the numerous French warships. After the British were gone, Renault talked again with Pétain and Vega. They again took up their argument that France should treat with the enemy. Britain could not or would not help them. Renault, desperate, retorted by saying that if France broke from Britain, then Churchill would break altogether from France, and they would have to negotiate alone with Hitler. The generals countered with their belief that, once France stopped fighting, it was only a matter of days before Britain would see the reality and have to follow suit, no matter the declarations of Churchill. So all the day of June 12th, the deplorable news kept coming in about the disintegrating French defenses. West of Paris, the Germans were about to approach Avru, about 40 miles away from Paris. To the east, the invaders had made it below the city of Reims. Paris would soon be surrounded and cut off. For Vega, the Battle of France was lost. At 1.15 p.m., Vega gave the go-ahead to Georges to issue the general retreat order he wrote out on the 11th. He decided it was time, as commander-in-chief, and along with Vice Premier Pétain, to ask the government to send out the Germans about an armistice. There would be a full cabinet meeting at 7 p.m. at the chateau where the President of the Republic was staying. Vega did not know how the cabinet would vote, but he felt the question had to be put before them. But he did know what Renault's response would be. Renault was certainly within his right to not allow the commander-in-chief to attend the meeting, but he allowed it anyhow. Many of the cabinet did not know of the dreaded details of the French defensive collapse, but they were about to find out. The 23 ministers gathered, but were already numbed beyond belief by the hordes of refugees passing by the chateau. Vega wasted no time in telling the ministers that he believed asking the Germans for an armistice was the only way to save any hope of order or the soon-to-be starving millions of French people running south to God knows where. Renault tried to rally the ministers to his side by saying Hitler would take more from them than they were willing to give, so it was pointless to treat with him. He again mentioned the Brittany Redoubt and again North Africa. Vega said there were not enough troops to defend either one, and he was more or less correct, but in the end, Vega was unable to carry the day or sway the cabinet. But before they departed, 
there was one more item to discuss. Renault brought up Churchill's request to be advised before the French asked the Germans for terms. So the question really was, should Churchill be invited back to speak before the cabinet? But here things backfired for Renault. He wanted Churchill to come and give him support. But the feeling within the cabinet was, let's talk to the British because it's almost time to talk to the Germans. The meeting broke up at 11 p.m. on June 12th. June 13th would turn out to be a watershed day for France. Churchill came to meet the cabinet at 2 p.m. This time, he brought Lords Halifax and Beaverbrook with him. But things were obviously worse since Churchill last came. First off, there was no one to meet the British at the recently bombed airport. So, borrowing a car, the British party made their own way. Upon arrival, a very modest lunch was put together for them as they had a briefing with Badeau, the Undersecretary of the Foreign Office. Badeau straight away went into the hopelessness of the French defensive position. Churchill, who did not want to have this conversation again, talked of America coming into the war and, at the very least, Britain's commitment to fight on. Finished eating, they moved themselves to where the cabinet members would be. They found Mandel on the phone doing everything he could to keep the resistance going. His presence cheered the British up considerably. Mandel had been brought in to rid the cabinet of defeatists and was passionate about his assignment. He wanted to fight the Germans and move the government to North Africa. Renault finally met them at 3.30 p.m. But unlike the other meetings, this one would only be attended by Renault and the British. Renault needed to be direct with them without any French ears nearby. The French Premier put forward the question, would Britain allow France to make a separate peace with Germany? But remembering his place in history, Renault put the question forward as hypothetical, with a French government of which he would not be a part of. Churchill replied that, although they couldn't care a tuppence about assigning blame, they could not release France from her agreement. The meeting was adjourned so each side could talk amongst themselves. The meeting started again, but the conversation was circular. Churchill told Renault that the British were unable to release the French from their obligations, so Renault shrunk in his chair. Churchill, trying to buck up the Premier, told him the first thing they should do is contact Roosevelt. Maybe we can describe the situation and get the U.S. to declare war in Germany, or at the very least, supply the French until America was in the war. This was an amazing, desperate statement from Churchill. He knew Roosevelt was getting ready for election. Moreover, Roosevelt was trying to win an unprecedented third term. The last thing he needed was to tell the voters he was taking them to war. Renault also knew America enough to know it would not happen, but he made himself believe it. Anything to have hope. Churchill knew, after all these meetings, this was the moment of truth between the two leaders. There was another consequence of France separating itself from Britain. Churchill told Renault that if France comes under the power of Germany, Britain would have no choice but to extend their growing blockade around France. Food and supplies could not be allowed into France if they were to end up in German hands. Probably accepting what was coming, the British Prime Minister then asked Renault how long before he asked Germany for an armistice. Renault, embarrassed, evaded the question. Then he talked of help from America, but then ended by saying if the American response was negative, there would be grave consequences for everyone involved, as if to put the blame on the U.S. So no decision would be made by anyone until they heard from Roosevelt. So at 5.50 p.m. the meeting ended and the British left for London. Probably due to the conversation not going his way, Renault forgot to ask the British to stay and meet with the entire cabinet. This would prove costly for France. Since nothing had changed, it was time for more politics. De Gaulle had arrived near the end of the meeting and chastised his superior for thinking of an armistice. Renault replied that he had lied to the British in order to scare them into giving France more supplies, planes, and men. Soon after the meeting, Badeau told a newspaper man that Churchill understood France's situation and would understand if she wanted to go her own way in regards to Germany. De Gaulle was revolted and wrote out his resignation, but the forceful Mandel tore it up. De Gaulle was needed to combat the defeatists. This act by Mandel saved de Gaulle's career for the future. Renault rushed to the cabinet meeting, attended by President Le Bras, but without Churchill, as promised. The cabinet meeting was to have started at 3 p.m., but it was moved to 5 p.m. 
but no one was informed due to poor communication. So the ministers had been waiting in the garden of the president's chateau, their nerves on edge, since 3 p.m. When Renault showed up without Churchill, the mood turned even more ugly. When questioned, Renault was vague on why Churchill did not accompany him to this important meeting. He then started a new storm of outrage by telling the cabinet that he had told the prime minister that France would stay in the fight beside Britain. Of course, Renault did no such thing. Soon charges and countercharges about the armistice were flying like artillery shells, and finally, President Le Bras stepped in. He wanted to hear from Vega. Vega walked into the center of this group of men to begin the next act of this circus. He went into the pathetic defensive situation of France and castigated the ministers for not having the courage to ask for an armistice. Vega declared all he cared about were the people of France. He accused these greedy men of only caring about themselves. He then reiterated that they should have all stayed in Paris and sacrificed themselves, like the Roman senators of old. Did they think they could go to London or North Africa until the U.S. could build up enough tanks and planes to liberate their country for them? On a side note, that's pretty much what happened. He finished by indirectly saying that he had had enough and he would not listen to them or take orders from them any more. There was now a clear break between the military and the civilian-led government. But Vega wasn't done. Clearly, he thought it was a moment for some much-needed levity. He informed the ministers that he had just heard that the mutually hated communists had taken over Paris and the police were disbanded. Everyone was shocked. Of course, the shock robbed everyone of figuring out that even if this was true, and it was later found out not to be, it would have mattered little. The Nazis were just outside of Paris and would not have allowed the French communists or Republicans, both their enemies, to stay in power. But then, to outdo his statement, Vega looked at Mendel, and it appeared to the commander-in-chief that the minister was smiling at him. This was too much for Vega. He stood and declared, I'm leaving. A minister laughed at me. Soon he was gone, yelling over his shoulder of the idiocy of politicians. It turns out that Mandel had a rictus in his face, which sometimes was mistook for a smile. But obviously, Mandel was just as depressed as everyone else, with little to smile about. Now, the normally silent Patan spoke up. His eyesight and hearing were fading, so he stepped to where the light was better. He first spoke in support of Supreme Commander Vega, and then wanted to read out something he had written the day before. Without quoting it verbatim, Pétain threw in his opinion that the government should not leave French soil, that it would no longer be the French government if they left, that he was staying and sharing the suffering of his people, and that somehow the armistice was the necessary condition for the perpetuity of an eternal France. So the meeting ended late that afternoon, but again, nothing was decided, except now there was a clear split between the civilian government and the military, which was supposed to obey their civilian leaders. Also, the events of this day saw many in the cabinet have their resolve to resist Germany crushed. They would now follow the military, and very soon, Patton would either put some thought-out plan into motion or choose this moment to come alive and act, but not for Renault, for France, or for France in the embodiment of himself. While this sad tale of woe was playing out southwest of Paris, that same afternoon at 5.10 p.m. on the 13th, the French radio picked up a message from the German high command. An envoy was being sent into town, under a white flag, to discuss the terms of surrendering the city. So the commander of the Paris region met the envoy, but told the Germans he did not have the authority to sign anything. The Germans would not be put off. They had experience in dealing with governments and politicians trying to delay while holding out hope for some type of salvation. So the Germans sent out another message at 2.20 a.m. on the morning of June 14th. That again was picked up by French radio. The message was a tried and true move that said the German envoy had been killed by a French sniper. The German high command demanded the offender be apprehended and a French officer be sent to them by 5 a.m. with the proper authority to sign a document concerning Paris. If this did not happen, Paris would be attacked. A major was sent out and signed the terms at 6 a.m. on June 14, 1940. All French civilians were to stay indoors for 48 hours, the police were to return, and water, electricity, and communications were not to be disturbed. So on June 14th, 
Paris was undefended and occupied by General von Kuchler's 18th Army. The German troops wasted no time in hoisting the swastika over the Eiffel Tower. Next time, we'll watch Renault fall and Pétain rise. Mussolini will fall militarily, and Hitler will experience his greatest moment as the Nazi warlord. Meanwhile, Britain will brace itself to take on the greatest military machine the world has ever known, with practically no equipped army, but only with a relatively few brave pilots and the latest fighter planes available to them. <laughs>